Hello, everybody. Tom Matuska and Brett Wingfield here for the Matuska Taxidermy Supply Company. And uh, we just got back from a action packed <laughs> world taxidermy <laughs> competition yeah, and show and, uh, in Springfield, Missouri. And this is probably one of the best shows we've ever put that on. Week flew by. It did. We got there on uh, Tuesday. Easy. We went down on Tuesday. Um, giant trailer and <laughs> truckloads of people to help us set up. And um, we thought, man, it's only Tuesday. We got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you know, and this could be a long week. And all of a sudden it was Saturday and it, it, it flew by. Fast. Um, it was a great show. Um, Kathy and Larry put on another spectacular yes, um, event. And um, we had a, a booth that Made was, a lot of people envious, it didn't was, it? It was hopping. It was hopping. We we got to meet a lot of these people. I know. That's a true. A whole bunch um, of people. Many, many, many of you came up and said, we watch you every <laughs> Thursday afternoon, and I'm so embarrassed. Yep. And I mean, my old hand was sore from autographs. <laughs> How about you? Um, not really. Shaking hands. But <laughs> we shook a lot of hands. We did. Um, and Mandy had uh, so many specials and so many free giveaways. Um, I, think I think they had just under $10,000 worth of free yeah. giveaways, everything. I can't even name all the things. Um, Ave Studio um, fixed some oh, stuff. Yeah. I can't, I'm going to leave somebody um, out, so I shouldn't even start this. Um, Createx um, yeah. was extremely kind to us. Uh, Life Tone uh, Paint. Yeah. Pro um, One. Uh, Pro One, oh my gosh. Uh, we, had, we had a ton of giveaways, and I think there are even a maybe maybe not still a few discounts if they phone in oh yeah um i think online. there's online. oh if they order online it's still good for yeah i think there's a few different and how much they get off so right now we currently have 10 percent off the entire store but that does not oh, wow. include our manufactured items and then we also have 20 percent 30% and 25% off doorbusters, and those are going to be automatically um, applied. So if you are going oh, wow. to use the 10%, you will need to put World Show 22 in the notes section on the cart page. Wow. And that goes till Friday at midnight. A couple days left. If they example. can't remember all that stuff, can they call in? Absolutely. Or they can rewind Or you, Facebook. Right? Yeah, they can rewind <laughs> this. <laughs> That's a good message idea. on Facebook or call in, yeah. of course. Absolutely. Um, and we had clothing. Matuska Taxidermy oh clothing yeah. um, to die for. We had, we had more attire and apparel we than did. a Cabela's or a Shield store. We had a bunch. And racks there was a and bunch walking around the show. Racks and there, racks. And, yeah. and there was more... Matuska Taxidermy Supply um, clothing around there than, than we have. Pretty proud. That was um, pretty neat. And uh, we had uh, a lot of, a lot of guests. Uh, yeah, here again, I'm going to leave somebody out. <laughs> um, a lot of seminars right in our booth. So not only yeah. could you go to the seminars that the World Show put on, but you could uh, come to our booth. And um, uh, we had Kevin Wiebe doing a beautiful yep. widget. widget. Uh, yeah. using the metal reed display. Yeah. Um, man, to do a widget like that in front of all those people. Um, he got pretty yeah. nervous when, when uh, <laughs> Corey put on his yeah, glasses to look at it, and he walks up real close, and he said, man, I've never been so you know, <laughs> concerned in my life. And yeah. Corey, said, Corey said, it's a beautiful, beautiful bird. Yeah. Um, and to get that from Corey Crothers, it has to be a beautiful bird. Um, uh, uh, new world champion, Blake Reiminger. <coughs> Oh my gosh. Um, did a bird seminar for us, and later we got to cheer for him as he won best in the world with a turkey. Yep. Yep. And Clint, Clint um, Ricky with his odd ad. Yep. Clint won with an odd ad. Um, both Taxidermy University guys. Yep. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a fun show. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. It went by so fast. And uh, thanks to Tim Perkins and uh, Mike, Mike Yeska, Yeska and Mark and Gonnering. Mark yeah. Gonnering and Marshall from yeah. Pinchback. Uh, and Cole. Artificial Skull Reproductions. Yeah. Cole, Cole did a bobcat, what, ear yeah. setting, eye setting. Yeah. Um, Cole does a beautiful bobcat. And all you had to do was stand there and 
It's a little bit nicer in our booth because it's a little more relaxed, and yeah. people can stand this far from the person okay. giving the seminar. Yeah. And uh, we call them seminarians, but they're not really <laughs> in the priesthood. But anyway, the seminarians, you can talk to them and, and yeah. realize that they kind of put their pants on just like you do one leg at a yeah. time. And yeah. it's not quite so intimidating. And they're really, all of the guys that we had in our booth um, doing seminars were, you too. Um, I'm you too. <laughs> you too. <laughs> were uh, extremely helpful. And we had people just asking questions that they normally yeah. wouldn't ask because they'd be too intimidated to ask at a big seminar. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people learned a lot of different things at our booth, and we had specials on all the products. Um, introduced everything that we had in the catalog new for this year. Yeah. Um, a lot of really, really, really cool products that you get to see and touch and feel and see yeah. how people use them for the first time. So that was a big deal. It was. It really was. And fortunately, we won't have to do that again for a couple of years. Yeah, two years, yeah. So yeah. if you ever get a chance um, and haven't been or haven't mm -hmm. been for a while, make sure that you make plans in two years to go to the World Show. Or yeah. you can go somewhere exotic <laughs> next yeah. year oh, yeah. overseas. Um, and worth noting, too, we did a really nice walkthrough for the people that didn't get to see it um, in person. Um, we did spend an hour walking through yep. all the mounts. Um, Kate videoed that for us, and we walked through with Corey. Yep. And um, so there's a nice preview on Facebook or you is it on YouTube now too, Kate? The walk World Show walkthrough. Yep, it's yeah. on YouTube and Facebook. Nice. Yeah. So they can. So you get a glimpse of some. I mean, there's some yep. really, oh, really special, special work there. And yeah. Pardon me if we missed anybody, <laughs> uh, because there was just yeah. too much to see. Um, the camera was up and down and over. I mean, there's just too much. So there is. Um, usually when we do that sort of thing, and we didn't talk because there was <laughs> so <laughs> much so to comment on, yeah. um, you know you're going to miss somebody. Yeah. So Kate was just filming like crazy as we slowly walked through. And uh, for sure, we always miss somebody. So I apologize yeah. if you didn't see or, you know, something that you worked yeah. really, really hard on. But we did our best. And you can watch mm -hmm. that on YouTube. Yep. Yep. And if you... Uh, joined us um, last week and the previous weeks we talked about tanning mm -hmm. and the tanning that we demonstrated was a tanning method that we use for um, our deer capes it's easy um, you need a flushing machine to do it a sharp knife a few tools and um, it uh this is my in the way whoops you hear me now there we go <laughs> um, anyway we, uh, um, it's what we use for our deer heads, and it's easy, it's inexpensive, the results are great. Um, we have yeah. no issues with it whatsoever. Um, you can do it in home, you can do it, you saw us do it in a tub, you saw us yeah. take the deer head right out of the tub and, and flush on it. And a lot of different ways to handle it once it's tanned, but like we, uh, told you we like to dry them and I just picked this up and took the boards out of it today but look how flexible it is now this is not like chamois tan like you get right. a soft tan back from the tannery but this hide well what would you say how long how would you rehydrate this now so at this point we would run a sink full of water or a bucket um, we would put a handful of salt good handful of salt uh, bacteria side and the one thing we haven't done with it is Protex pre-soak our bug no, proofer no bug proofer in this yep. yet so we add a, about an ounce per gallon or half an ounce per gallon of Protex pre-soak and oh how long would you say we'd soak that up a couple hours yeah um, this feels thin um, you're gonna notice when you put it in the rehydration that Brett's talking about the thinner it is, the faster it's going to soak up. Yeah. This feels to me, because it's so soft, feels like you did a nice job nice. on the flushing machine, I can tell. And this is going to soak up. I'd say in 15 minutes, everything's going to be soft enough almost to mount, except maybe where it's a little thick around the ear bases, around the antler burrs. Just depends yeah. where there's any thicker spots. may take longer. But this is going to soak up really fast. And then... After we soak it up initially in the sink, we normally like to sweat ours. Um, 
So we would put it in a bag overnight, mm -hmm. um, throw it in the refrigerator, and then come back the next morning and stretch it and get a good reconfirm re our measurement on it. You should get back your the measurement mm -hmm. we took when we neutralized it, um, and then we can purchase our mannequin and put it together. Okay, now say say they learn how to tan from us on TV. And, okay. uh, <laughs> and uh, they soaked this up. Now they measured the cape when it came in. And let's say it's 19 by 21. 19 right behind the ears, 21 a couple inches down. Um, say they only get about 17 inches. What do they do? Um, check their punch code first and make sure it's the right cape. Good point. Because they did, they did put a punch code in it. We showed you how to do that. And that's important so that we have a permanent record. If this tag falls off, um, we still yeah. have record of whose cape that is and with the code. And here's our punch code right here, number 314, so 314. Yeah. And we punched it twice. Here's the other one over here, um, 314. So it's, um, it's been touch, punched twice in case that tag comes off. Yep. So after we confirm that it's still that and it's still smaller than we want it to be, um, then we get out the hide stretcher. No. Um, then one, make sure that it's been rehydrated well. Um, we're gonna, we don't have to chew on it, we hope, but if you do, that might help. Um, and then we're going to check to make sure that it's well rehydrated, stretch it really, really good, maybe rehydrate it again or sponge on some more water. Um, and then we'll, I think we would confirm our, our measurement numbers, make sure it's not cold. That's another thing right out of the refrigerator. It probably won't get as much stretch as it would once it comes up to room temperature. And what else am I forgetting? All, all good points. The cold reminds me of uh, when we had students and we do fish and oh, yeah. they would put a fish in the refrigerator overnight and they'd get them out yeah. the next morning to test fit them on their body and they don't, come within two inches yep. in the back and they yep. start shaving down their body. By the time they get their body shaved down to fit that skin, the skin is warmed up and overlapped. <laughs> yep. um, it's a little bit similar with this. We've done that yep. too. People will take these out of the refrigerator cold in the morning and they'll lay them out and instead of 17, you go 16. So yep. cold, cold is one thing. Yep. And most often we find that if this is fleshed properly, it's gonna go back to those original measurements yep. with ease. Yep. Um, that's a good point too. If they needed to and they felt like it was thick, you could run it over the machine sure. again. The tanning oil that we put on has made has now had an opportunity to make a chemical bond, so you're not going to hurt anything by running it over the machine one more time. Um, and you might give you might gain a little bit of stretch out of that too. Um, and another thing, if you'd want to store this. Um, mm -hmm. What we usually do is we will soak it up because we're, we're going to mount it eventually. Um, you soak it up, drain it, put it in a bag, tag it with the person's name on it, and just put it in the freezer. And yeah. when you take it out, it's gonna be supple soft because water in this hide, that freezes kind of expands and it breaks the fibers automatically That's for true you. Too. Yep. Um, yep. Leaving this, we found, leaving a cape tanned in this manner, I think you could do it for a year, but I get a little nervous after a year. I feel that they don't stretch as good if you let them dry, nor do your um, commercially tan hides. Right. I used to think I was pretty clever. I would hang all my hides up on my wall in my showroom and I'd have leopards and grizzly bears and black bears and customers would come in and they'd go, wow. And by the time it came time to mount them, I didn't get the stretch out of them that sure. I thought I should. Even yeah. tan hides in a dry state do not, yeah. you know, cold their stretch very good. But once they're rehydrated and put in the freezer, if, if it didn't sit out dry too long, um, 30 gosh, years. they last a, yeah, forever. They'll last a long yeah. time. They'll last the forever as long as they're frozen. frozen. State, so. and, and even a, a dry state, we have uh, dried hides that we've got back from the tannery of our own yeah. that we never soaked up. We just put them in the freezer. And those two yeah. um, will rehydrate yeah. and soak up real good. Yeah. It's that freezing that helps yeah. so much. I think Kate's been trying to wave to us for a minute or two. <laughs> it's all good. We just have a few comments from some people tuning in. We've got Todd Buchanan, who said, you all did good at the World Show. Love the seminars and live feeds. Thank and, you. Thank you. And then uh, we've got Michael tuning in from East Tennessee. 
Uh, James Hibbert would like to know if we will be attending the main show in August. Uh, I don't believe we That's are. a long ways. That is a long ways from here. We thought Missouri was far. <laughs> Uh, and then let's we see. We don't say no, but we yeah. <laughs> didn't say yes yet. Yeah, we just got some. We've got a hello from Michael Sears in Ohio. Um, Heather Crow, got Fred Burks, Mark oh. Pontius said, oh. I agree regarding the booth. He won big at the booth. He won yeah. big at the booth. <laughs> he spent big at the booth. Yeah. Thanks for supporting us. And we'll see, I will see Mark in Oklahoma in a few weeks too. Okay, um, today we're going to talk about you want to be a taxidermist. So you want to be a taxidermist <laughs> yeah. is how we've been saying it. Uh, uh, we have kind of learned this from so many students that have come over the years. Um, we always say the first day they come into the studio or the school to start, um, what made you decide you know, to be a taxidermist? I love to hunt and fish. Now, <laughs> good for you because yes. you're going to be sitting skinning, um, taking in, being there for customers when the mallards are flying yeah. and the deer are rutting and the fish, fish are, are chomping. Yeah. And uh, that's sometimes not the best combination is love to be outdoors. You love animals and all of that. But <laughs> sometimes that causes issues yeah. with your work. And so... Uh, just bear that in mind. If you want to get yeah. into the taxidermy uh, business and you want to do taxidermy, um, sometimes it might conflict yeah. with your other um, work-life balance. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so we thought today, um, and we might carry this into next week. I think a little mm -hmm. bit. We're going to get into pricing, and I don't know how far we'll get today. But uh, we want to start you on a new on the right foot, and and uh, talking to so many people at the show. And so many people that call in, um, I can't tell you how many calls I get that say, um, I'm just starting out in taxidermy. And yep. there's right ways to go and there's wrong ways to go. And you can save yourself a whole lot of headaches and heartaches by yeah. developing good business ethics and habits right off the bat um, and just starting on the right foot. Yep, yep, couldn't say that better. It's starting out on the right foot is imperative it's hard to go backwards in this so um, we had a we teach this we always taught the students uh, licensing you want to be licensed any of you that want to be a taxidermist you have to be licensed for sure yeah. if you're going to do birds migratory birds you have to have a federal migratory bird permit yeah. um, to do taxidermy work as well as most states not all but most states require you to get a taxidermy permit or license to do taxidermy work. Um, ours now, we can go up to Walmart and get our, yeah. get our uh, taxidermy permits, and now we can get them online. Online, yeah. Uh, yep. I used to go up to our Walmart here, and I'd say, I'd like to get a taxidermy license, and two years in a row, the guy says, do we even sell those? <laughs> you know, they didn't even know because they, yeah. they sell like one a year to me. Yeah. <clears throat> but you're gonna want a state license and typically the state wants to keep track of mm -hmm. your interaction with everything deer yeah. birds fish yeah. the whole gamut um, the federal um, taxidermy license is to keep track of mainly the migratory birds um, any of the CITES animals any of the grizzly bears or wolverines you know different things that are have a, protected status of some nature. Uh, they want to make sure that you're keeping records of that, that you can mm -hmm. have that sort of thing. Um, so you're going to need those two things. You can't get the, the federal wants you to get a state before you get the federal. So contact your state. Just, you know, if you're on a, you know, friendly basis with your DNR officer, just tell them, what do I have to do? And they will set you up with an application yeah. or whatever it takes for your state. Um, if you're not on a friendly basis with your <laughs> DNR officer, maybe you probably need to get that way soon. They'll be visiting um, you. Yeah. Um, and then once you get that, usually that'll have a number on it. And that number will be asked for when you get your federal yeah. license. Yeah. And like Iowa, I think is every year. And the federal might be three. It's, I think it is three. Three yeah. years. Yeah. Um, but you're going to need both of those. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people starting out in taxidermy 
come from various backgrounds, I don't know that everybody realizes how well governed or well managed um, wildlife is. Wildlife's a big deal and there's a lot of information um, to make sure that you know. So if you're getting started in this, um, don't be afraid to do some research, not just or some research beyond just licensing to their regulations and so forth. Um, Lacey Act issues come to mind, transporting wildlife, accepting wildlife, bringing in things. So. CWD across the yep. state lines, yep. there's a lot of little things. Some states things. you can cross, others you can't. We've got Mark King, and he is wondering, I have a tanned white tail cape put away. If I hydrate it to measure, do I keep it moist while I'm waiting on the mannequin, or do I let it dry, then rehydrate again? I, I would prefer to put it in the freezer. Yeah, I think that's for sure. If, if you rehydrate it, which is the only way to good, get a good measurement, um, you're going to want to freeze it, unless you're going to go down the street and pick up yeah, a mannequin. A day or, a day or two day. behind, yeah. you could refrigerate it. Yeah. Um, if it's very long, much longer than that, I would like to freeze it. And uh, we, we, a lot of times, if we're going to work on a hide shortly, like in a few days, we will lay it out flat in our freezer, mm -hmm. and it will freeze really quick, and it'll thaw out within an hour, probably, yeah. or less. Yeah. So it, we don't have to wait that whole day of thawing time, but freezing it's the safest. Um, we've dried them before to send to people. We if somebody um, wanted a tan one to send it to it, we dried them. Yep. Or yep. take your measurements bef out of the neutralizing mm -hmm. stage, and you can order the form while they're in the dry stage. Yep. Yep. So then you don't have to uh, do anything with them, just let them um, yeah. Then you'll have your dry. forms on hand, and you can rehydrate rehydrate them as needed. Mm -hmm. um, okay, going back to to licensing, along with licensing, and the licenses are kind of self-explanatory. Yep. Basically, they are going to ask. It's almost like the states are like a hunting or fishing license. They're going to ask for your your name, your address, um, date of birth, that sort of thing that they keep track of you, um, where you're going to be doing your taxidermy business because yeah. many states have an annual inspection um, and uh, I know Minnesota and I would do where the game warden will actually come in um, a lot of times look look at your freezer they want to see yeah. that everything's tanned like it's supposed to be or tagged like it's supposed to be um, they're gonna look at your records yeah um, something in our state which is kind of interesting is um, they always look at our um, um, the little validation code? Yeah, that yeah. you have to call in. Yeah. And they want to make sure that the deer was registered. Yeah. And uh, um, one of our game wardens a while back would come in and take all my invoices, and he'd photograph every single one. And then at his leisure, he could go and check all of these people that they had a valid license yeah. and things like that. So different, um, um, different states are going to have different, you know, how to keep track of you type of a yeah. thing. Um, we had a game warden at one time that said he spent an hour every day on Facebook mm -hmm. watching your posts. Yep. So if you're holding up yours and your buddy's walleyes, you're going to get a visit. You know? <laughs> and I thought that was pretty clever. That was, yeah. He did that as part of his law enforcement sure. um, duties. It was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about the game warden, and you mentioned before, making sure that you're, you have a good relationship with that individual. and, and I think a lot of people struggle with that or feel like that's a little bit intimidating, but that person, you are a great link to the wildlife world or industry through that game warden. So he wants to be your friend. He wants to be able to count on your record book. And as you're building these things, starting your business, a, a great start is to go shake hands with the game warden and ask him what he would, what would benefit him the most, how your books could um, be easiest for him to look through. And, and a lot of times establishing that relationship will come back. And, and they love to see you. your shop too, yep. not, not just to check you out, but this is interesting to them. Yep. Um, so we always have, you know, DNR people or fishing yep. game people that stop in just to check us yep. out. So we like to bring them back and show them, you know, all the stuff that we're working on and, and that kind of thing yep. goes a long ways towards rapport. Yeah. Just a username, Moccasin Man on YouTube. And he says, Hi guys, great show. I have a bobcat that I skinned and fleshed, 
and dry it on a board for the fur trade. Could I rehydrate it and pickle and tan it, or is it too late? No, you can rehydrate it yeah. and pickle and tan it. Depends on what you're tanning it for. Yeah. Um, I have, I found a long time ago that usually when they're um, tanned like a trapper, tan, or trapper dried, mm -hmm. where they're dried, the ears usually weren't turned inside out and salt never got through that yeah. um, cartilage. So to rehydrate them, if you're gonna use them to, for mounting purposes, I'm gonna bet that you're gonna lose the hair in the ears. Oftentimes, anyway. Um, lip lines and, and the noses lines, yeah. sometimes. Or... Because the lips weren't split, nose yeah. wasn't split. As far as just tanning for fur value, um, yeah, and it takes a, a, a bobcat's not so bad. I bought a mountain lion one time, took me a year to soften it up. <laughs> I didn't know anything about rehydration sure. baths and stuff. But a bobcat is thin and should soften up quite well. You're going to want to um, Google it, but there's recipes for um, a little bit of salt, water, and you want to soften them up as soon as you can, um, wring them out, drain them, salt them, and then into a pickle. Yeah, get them safe with that acid yeah. and bacteria side. So I'm going to say yes, you'll have them for fur value, but you might not have them for a really nice mount. Yeah. Yeah. And then along with um, the records, your record keeping, mm -hmm. you're also going to have to keep tagged, everything's going to have to be tagged in accordance with the state and the federal government. Yeah. And there's lots of different methods of tagging, but it all has to contain the same information, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, any wildlife product will have to have a tag on it. Um, and I say that because it's reproduction fish um, are plastic. Yeah. So although you want to keep track of those too. Sure. Um, that's a part. I know I talked to a couple different guys that um, were wood carvers and wanted to get into the reproduction fish business and that's a little bit different than the taxidermy sure. business because it's artificial. But. Um, we've had a lot of people question that over yeah. the years. Yeah. It's a fish. You got to do it. No, it's <laughs> not. It's a model car. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a tag that, uh, that we use and these are tie back. You can't break them, tear them, um, nothing can happen to these and on this tag you're going to get your license from the state your license from the federal government and it's going to tell you what you have to have on your tag and what you have to have in a log book mm -hmm. um, on the tag we're going to have to many states some states require it some don't this one has license number and that's so you know, a game warden could look at something and say, that see, his license was this and this and this, let's check that out, you know, and he can pull up his records yeah. and find out if this person actually had a license. It's, it's called a paper trail. Um, it's got his name, address, city, state, zip, the state in which it was taken, what it is, number of, DOK is called date of kill. That's, this one says date killed, that's very important. And then a signature of the hunter. Now, different states require different amounts of this information, but this tag will cover it all. I, yeah, I think it covers almost every I state. I think it's all there. Um, they may not have to fill out yep. every line, but. So we will fill this out for the customer, like customer brings in a deer. We will fill this out. We will write his name really big on the back so that we can find it in the freezer. And this gets attached to, um, if it's a deer, we might wrap it around the antlers yeah. or um, you know, around a raccoon foot or a bird foot or stick it in the bag just so it's with that specimen. Yeah. And worth saying too, every antlered animal we fill out two cards for because one goes on the antlers and one goes on the hide. Um, and I always found it humorous because I asked the game warden, say a customer comes in and he wants an antler mount but save the cape for him and have it tanned. He wants the body skin made for a rug. He wants the tail saved, and he wants the hoofs for a gun rack. Do I need six tags? The answer is yes. Yep. So if you start every part. dismembering the animal and you need all these different, have all these different parts, and you have a pickle with hooves over here, and you have a hide that went to the tannery, tag for each, yep. which can be, yep a little a lot of writing yeah. um, but anyway it doesn't have to be a tag like this 
I used to, when I first started out, I'd get that uh, tablecloth material, like for summer picnics, you put it over mm -hmm. a picnic table, it's plastic, and I would cut strips about like this, and I would take a paper punch, and I would put a string in it or a twist tie, and mm -hmm. I wrote all this information on that, which is easy to yeah. forget something, because it doesn't have the little, you know, tips to write in. But um, I used that plastic material forever. Sure. Um, sure. It does not have to be a boughten tag. You can buy these for, I don't know what they are, um, six, seven, eight dollars yeah. a 50 probably. Um, it doesn't have to be this. We also mm -hmm. have um, these waterproof tags. Nice thing about these is they'll go through a pickle and nothing will happen to them. Yeah. Um, we just got African hides back from the tannery and they still had our original tags with the customer's yep. name on with this all filled out. Yep. It went through a commercial tannery, tannery process, process and came back. We yep. didn't have to write all new tags for them. Um, here are little meat processing tags like you get at a locker plant. And same thing, you can't tear them, you can't break them. They got a little metal grommet in them. And, but they're a little small if you're gonna be writing all that information. Right. We use these on fish and that sort of thing. Yes. We've got Rachel, I'm going to butcher this, Biagani, and she I says, think that sounded, that sounded real nice. <laughs> yeah. Hi guys, I'm one of those just starting out taxidermist. I've watched all of your fish videos oh, no. and have learned so much. I appreciate all your tips and tricks. You guys are the best. Oh, oh. thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, another note too, just about tags, is occasionally you'll see some that are labeled federal yep. waterfowl tags. Mm -hmm. Um, this would serve the same purpose. Um, those tags that say federal waterfowl tags just have the same amount of content, but it's all right here. This would be the same thing. Would You don't have to buy a tag that says federal. And to my knowledge, the federal government does not print any kind of right. tag. It was a supply company that put water, migratory waterfowl yeah, tagging system like, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, in addition, now when you get your state and federal laws, they're going to tell you very plainly what you have to do. Yep. So the one thing is a tag. Everything in your freezer has to be a tag, has to be tagged. Yep. Um, the other thing is you have to keep a log, and this is, this is our log book. It's just called Taxidermy Records. But in here, it has the same information that's on the tag. Um, this has included mount costs, payment schedules, a sketch if you want to, it's got extra information that you really aren't, isn't required by the law, but it's kind of handy to have. Yeah. So if your customer uh, paid you $100 a month on a deer head for a couple months, you can enter it in here. If he wanted something special like a semi-sneak with a head tipped up and on an airwood panel or something, you could make a little sketch in here. Sure. So these are awful handy for that purpose. And um, it says on the front, work recorded from a period of um, April 25th to um, April 13th of the next year. So whatever you get in, um, you can enter in here. And if you look, um, we got a whitetail, we got a prairie chicken, we got a walleye, pheasant, um, spring buck, a walleye, you know, a tar, you know, all kinds of different specimens. You don't have to have a different book for every, every right. species. I mean, the nice part about that is those are, as long as you keep it updated, those are chronological. So you'll have them in order that they came in so you can look them up, find, you can find information from that date too. And this is important. If you're gonna be in the taxidermy business, you can expect to be inspected. You know, yeah. that's, that's oh, why you fill out the state and federal um, uh, applications and you kind of give them permission to come in and inspect yep. your, your freezer. They're going to do a freezer check, that sort of thing. Yep. And when they do, they're going to pull out a bag, identify what's in it, look at the tag, go to that date in your book, and it should be the same as on that tag. Yep. This should correspond to this, yep. as well as the specimen in the bag. Yep. And... Um, you don't have to have a button book either. For years, we had a spiral notebook yeah. and we had lines in it where we had all of this information. We had the date, date of kill, name, address, all that sort of thing on there. And it worked, works really well. Yeah. Um, these are kind of nice because if you have the little 
um, name, you know, put the guy's name. If he has that, you know what to put there and you yeah. don't leave any blanks. And that's what I was going to say. If, and you know that if there's a blank, you're still missing in, important information. And that's a legal thing too. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If, if uh, for some reason they think you should be incarcerated or whatever, yeah. um, one of those little blanks left out can yeah. cause an issue. Yeah. Um, we had a student one time that, that went home and he started his business and he called me up and, and said that the game wardens had come and confiscated everything in his freezer. Now he had only been in business for a couple months, but they took everything in his freezer. And I said, was everything tagged and marked like we showed you in school? And he said, pretty much. <laughs> and the pretty much told me that it probably wasn't. Yeah. So I said, all you have to do is they're going to meet with him on Friday and they're going to slap his hands and they will help you. A game warden is yeah. going to help you get your act Absolutely. together. They're not going to typically yeah. put you in jail. Um, depends what you did. But uh, <laughs> they're going to help you. Anyway, so he met with them. Um, he wasn't properly tagged. A lot of the stuff was stuff he just put a guy's name in no date of killing and that sort of thing um, within six months of that period he lost his tax army license because they came in and checked on him again and he oh, did no. the same thing oh, no. and yeah. i think he lost it for a year yeah. or more and uh, yeah. that will put you out of the tax army business yeah and like many things their taxidermy is a privilege you have the opportunity to do this as long as you continue to uh, make good choices fill out your record books as you need to and um, comply but it's definitely something that is highly regulated and getting off on the right foot starting out with this record book is so important because we get busy really fast um, when you get involved in the taxidermy world all of a sudden buddies start to come out of the woodwork and it might not be super profitable to taxidermy, but everybody has something that they want you to practice on and you have to get a tag on all of those things. Sure. Get all of those things in the record book or all of a sudden you're gonna open up a freezer with 15 items and you don't have a good roadmap to where they go. So um, getting started off on the right foot is a And we pretty much leave those important. tags on. Well, like even, even send to the tannery, the African animals, we mm -hmm. leave the tags on even though we punch those animals yeah. and put a code to them. Yeah. And we will even write on this tag, code 123, like you saw us uh, punch the white tail. Um, now, now the other animal is, is punched and it has a tag. This gets yep. ripped off, we still have the punch to fall back yep. on. Um, that way there's no mix-ups. Yep. Um, we leave them on antlers as long as we can during the mounting process so that we make sure that antlers match hides. That's another thing to make sure that you're careful of is we have customers that bring in two or three mm -hmm. animals during the course of a season um, might be kids might be a second tag for iowa we can shoot a couple bucks here and um, making sure that the october deer was properly properly identified antlers and cape mm -hmm. and the november deer is properly mm -hmm. identified is more important than you think because you think you'll remember but until you get a lot in or you start getting old like me <laughs> okay so is everybody clear clear as mud as we could make it um you got to have a license you got a state and federal license to do tax from your work yeah you got to tag everything that comes in no exceptions yep. um there there's a little gray area if it's yours and that sort of thing if it's yours your own personal tag everything Tag, yes, no matter absolutely. what it happens to be. Yeah. Um, also, if we had a bag of fish um, that we're going to mount for the showroom, I make a tag for, I, mean, I might put three yeah. bluegill on it, but if there's a bluegill in a bass and walleye, I would have three tags. You know, just make absolutely. sure that you have a tag for every single one of them. Um, everything has to be tagged. Everything has to be entered in a log book, whether you make it yourself or um, you buy a system like this. Yeah. And I don't know, what are these? Um, you probably get a couple big stacks of those Tyvek tags um, and a record book for $40 or something like that, I'm guessing, $45. Yeah. Um, or you can make your own. You can cut the little squares. I used mm -hmm. to even take uh, 
two by fours and rip two by fours into a quarter inch. Sure. Then I drill holes through them, so I yeah. have a wood tag, and that way it came from the impresso impresso tags out there called, yeah. where yeah. they're a steel tag and you leave dents in the steel. Yeah. Um, that was my idea with my two by four tags, and then I would just tie them on to whatever it happened to be. Um, I still have specimens in the freezer with <laughs> wood tags on pieces. them. Yeah. Oh, that's um, fun. Okay, make sure, call us if you don't understand this, call this and we'll call us and we'll steer you into the right direction because yeah. it all starts right here or, or you'll be out of business before you yeah. get into business. Yeah. Um, the other thing we wanted to talk about today was uh, um, taking specimens in, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, why don't you tell them your thoughts on that? Taking it all in, take, all of it. Take everything <laughs> again, every snake and every gopher. No. Um, Taking animals in is a, a part of the system that we've kind of already that we've already established here, but it's something that you need to get a routine and a process down so that you don't forget steps. Um, we have to have it entered here. We have to have um, fully filled out tags. We need signatures and a good conversation. Uh, the right way to start that is a really good conversation with your customer as to what his expectation is and what you're going to be able to deliver to him. Um, what would we do? How would we start if we had somebody come in? Today? Um, if uh, we say a deer head comes in, mm -hmm. um, we'll get into pricing again in the future, maybe next week, yeah. because pricing is, is huge and you don't want to surprise them with the price. Um, when many people start, they'll customer will say, what's it going to cost me? And they've never taken one in before. So they said, that, let's see if it turns out. You know, and if it turns <laughs> out, um, I'll let you know. Uh, yeah. It's got to be up front right off the bat, or you're going to get a surprise, they're going to get a surprise, and your surprise is going to be they don't pay you. Um, so um, <laughs> we want to make sure that everything's very, very clear. But the first thing to do is check the animal over for damage, yeah. I think. Yeah. So we talked about slippage um, in many of our previous broadcasts where you're gonna pull on the hair gently to make sure it's good. You're gonna check the holes in it. Um, you're gonna, you know, bullet holes can be a problem. That yeah. cape that we tanned had a couple pretty major holes in it, air holes. And so you're gonna check that sort of thing. Yeah. You got a question for me? I do, we've got Craig Metz and Craig says, just got done at work so you may have answered this already. How often can a shop increase prices without upsetting customers? The you, way things are now, it seems to be necessary more often. You tell them. Oh, I think um, it, it's a real valid question. Um, but I think in this, in, in this climate today, I think we have to be pretty honest with our customers and be pretty flexible with them because if you're taking in a, an animal today, you may be purchasing supplies in a very volatile market six months from now or even a year from now depending upon what your backlog is um, I think establishing a a good relationship with the customer and an expectation that these numbers can vary um, this is this is our pricing and we're, we'll guarantee this pricing for X amount of time but um, I think we have to be careful just as a as a group we've got to be real careful about um, how we phrase those things, um, phrase those expectations. So, and it's pretty hard when somebody brings something in, even though you're paying more and more and more and more, um, you can't call him up and say, I'm gonna need another 25 bucks yeah, on your deer no. head. And a month later say, now I gotta have another $50 in your deer head. Yeah. Um, be, I, I guess I'd be more apt to raise my prices before I take it in than yeah. after. And if I'm gonna lose a little more money on one that I just took in because something cost me more, um, hopefully your your profit margin is enough that that's going to yeah. cover you through that. Um, you can't. I, I don't. I'm not comfortable calling up a customer and saying, "Oops, another no. fifty bucks, another hundred dollars." Um, but I think one way that we can work with that within that too on some of the bigger projects like life size projects, I think you could do like some of the contractors do possibly Time and offer them a a quote based on today and here's what here's what it looks like but um, I don't know that that's a good question and one we probably haven't dealt and things with. Things are raising, our things yeah. are going up pretty 
rapidly too. We haven't had to answer that question. 8.3%. Oh man, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, but uh, so we will cover pricing, I think much more extensive, yeah. I hopefully, hopefully next week. Um, but you're gonna check your animal over real careful. You're gonna check for damage, anything that's gonna cause you more problems. Yeah. Um, on this cape, uh, yeah, that cape. <laughs> um, this cape had a couple major holes in here. Um, I had a tax, taxidermist information a while back, and this was many, many years ago that this was printed, and he, charged, he gave them free repairs up to $45 worth. After that, he began charging them. Mm -hmm. um, I would say this was maybe a half hour's worth of work. By the time you get your yeah. thread and by the time you find your needle that fits and your thread that works and stuff like that, that's an, a half hour. That doesn't concern me at all in something like this. Um, we have replaced ears, we've replaced faces, we've, we've done major we've things, done which all. is a day's yeah. worth of work. Um, we've done antler repairs that are hugely um, labor intensive. So for that kind of thing, make sure you write that down and the customer knows that you know, it's gonna take you know, a lot of time and energy to fix that type of thing. But little things like this, this is little to us. Um, we don't even bring it up, kind of. Yeah, we would absorb some of that. Hey. All right, we've got, let's see. Patrick Stewart is wondering, what if you are starting out and you have three really good taxidermists in your area? One is a world champion. Where do you set your pricing? I know I'm not nearly as good as those guys. Um, that's, that's, I think, a question that most people getting into the taxidermy sure. world start with. And it, it's hard because that world champion probably is gonna take 10 hours to do your deer head and it's gonna take you 40. Sure. So how, sure, sure, sure. how do we set that? Um, it's very difficult. I think um, being honest with yourself about your expectations of your business, what do you expect out of yourself? You gotta pay yourself if you're gonna do this as a business. Um, I think, and we'll get into that as pricing, um, but I think you have to be, you, you can't undersell. That's the best dilemma to have in the entire world, and he doesn't realize it yet. Yeah. is to have somebody really, really good next to you because the way you're going to survive is to become better, faster, more efficient, more yep. creative. Um, that's good. If yeah. you have a, you will only live up, you know, you live up, your quality will only go as, probably yeah. as high as the guy next to you. So if you have somebody really, really good next to you, you're gonna strive to make your work better and better. That's a blessing That's a in disguise. Point. That's a really good point, yep. yep. Um, all right, so you're gonna need to write down everything that, that uh, you, a contract with the customers is mm -hmm. kind of what it is. And I started out with these. These are like little carbons that you write down all the information, you tear it off, customer gets one, you get one. Um, I used to have triplicates, so I'd fill out all the information. I kept the original in a file, alphabetical order. Customer got the yellow copy, and the other copy, copy went into a little uh, box in chronological order. So every once in a while around here, we can't find the invoice. Have you seen this invoice? Nope, should be under the H's. It's not under the H's. When did he bring it in? He brought it in last October. We can go through our chronological box. Here it is, you know, yeah. and we have a kind of a double safeguard so we know, um, can find it. But on here, it's got customer's name, address, date, telephone number, and then any of the information that you want to put in here. And down at the bottom, he signs it. You're going to have the price here. And by him signing that, he looked over all this stuff. He agrees that that's him. He agrees that's how he wants the mount. And he sees the price and he signed it. This became a contract. You know, it's not a big old document contract, but it's, it's really a contract. Um, we have much more elaborate ones now. We have a, a big sheet like this that 
um, has room for sketches and all kinds of different things and uh, base work you know that we can itemize on there but you're going to need something this would be a minimum I think this would be yeah. a minimum and uh, the ones we use now we just do on the computer I don't know if I have one up here um, I one. no hiding back there Um, this one's been written all over. Same, th same thing as this, um, date received, name, address, all that kind of thing. We have place for email on here, um, telephone number, what it is, mount description, base description, place for notes or a sketch, pricing information, and a signature. We make a copy of that and, and uh, give one to the customer and we keep one. So th this is the same thing, just a little more elaborate. And you can, you can look at ours if you want to, and they're just done on the computer, and they're real easy to do yeah. in the Word program. And that's a really important, it, it's very important to spend time getting directions and recording the directions from your customer so that you can meet their expectation. Because after you have a half a dozen deer on top of each other, it's going to be really tough to remember this person wanted him left, that person wanted him right. Um, there's a lot of information there and I think that um, one of the important things to remember is that we're handling some pretty precious memories for most people that are going to the trouble, effort, and expense to bring this stuff to a taxidermist. It means something to them. So. Um, having a good relationship with your customer and meeting their expectations, I think, is pretty important. And you're going to write on here, um, um, like you said, you know, right, left, semi sneak, sneak, whatever it happens to be. Um, if you forget right or left, don't guess. You got to call him up. Absolutely. Um, we yep. have people at the shows all the time say, "Do you have anything about a 20 by 22 and a semi sneak, right or left?" Oh, I don't know. It doesn't make any difference to him. You know, oh, it would to my customers. Yeah, it, yeah. So make sure that you check that stuff out. Um, make sure that you get a price down. And before we close today, the one thing we'll say is always get a deposit. A deposit yeah, is the most absolutely. important thing you're going to get out of this whole thing. And that's what's going to pay for your form. It's going to pay for your eyes. It's going to pay for you keeping that deer, send yeah. it to the tannery. Um, and you all of that labor that it took to get it to the point, yep. you're not going to collect a paycheck until after it's back right. to the customer. So, And um, it, it uh, kind of guarantees that they're going to pick it up because they have that much yep. money invested. And we've always gone by 50% deposit. So if a deer had um, used $1,000 this day and age for um, a figure, $500 is going to cover all of that. If you get stuck with a 200 inch whitetail on your showroom wall um, and $500 in, the, in your bank account, that's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it really is a privilege for us to do this and don't sell yourself short when it comes to pricing and that relationship with your customers because as fun as it is, you can lose a lot of money doing this if you, oh, if you give yes. your time away. So um, um, be, be very honest with yourself and your customer. And next week we're going to um, um, do a little more business, might touch on a little advertising, um, but we want to start you out on pricing because when um, I said $1,000, I saw a lot of people's eyebrows go, whoa, $1,000. <laughs> um, it's getting yeah. close to $1,000. Um, yeah. Absolutely. This, this is how much today? Mm, probably 85 bucks with 85 the nose, I bet. I bet there are places you can spend 100 on that same piece And you're going to spend, start to finish, how many hours on this? Oh, An man. Experienced I, tax terms like yourself to do a job that you're proud to put in the customer's hands. I don't know that we could get it done in less than 12 if we were really honest with our numbers, which we're not usually, but, <laughs> um, you know, you're going to have the better part of a couple days. By the time we do finish work, by the time we start on the front end with taking him apart, um, we'll go into all of the all of the hidden costs or expenses. And expenses when we start you don't talking. think about. Yeah. There's a lot you're 
people we, minimize yep um, the time that we spend with our customer the time that we spend ordering forms things like that all have to be factored in but a thousand dollar deer head is not I'm just coming back from the world show and talking to people um, they're all concerned about making a living and staying staying viable in the taxidermy yep. industry and uh, we heard a lot of nine hundred to a thousand dollar deer heads yep. prices so yeah and I think today we got a giveaway of do the record keeping system. a record keeping system yeah. the lucky winner is going to get um, taxidermist records as well as a bundle of taxidermy tags and whether you get this or not make sure that everything in your freezer um, yes. game wardens go through our broadcast and they look at every single pop-up on Facebook <laughs> and your every name one is, of you that are is watching kind of like, <laughs> kind of like the FBI if you put a post uh, or something um, but they're going to uh, look and they're gonna come to your yeah. door and they're gonna make sure that everything's taken not really but do it just in case and it's good for you it's good for the customer it's good to keep everything straight and it yeah. keeps you out of trouble and the winner is David Brello. And oh, David, and congratulations. So make sure to like and share this video to be entered in next week's giveaway. And we'll be here with a little bit of pricing, pricing. some advertising. Yep, organizing. I think. We've got a tremendous advertising staff here. I think we should we have them. They should do put it on the broadcast. I think we run the camera next week. We have an advertising <laughs> facility that and personnel that could rival just yes, about General Motors or Ford or <laughs> yes, we do. Boeing. We really do. <laughs> yes, we do. So it'll be fun. Next week will be fun. Um, make sure to have lots of questions. Um, those, those help us a lot yeah. when it comes, yeah, comes to Yeah, don't be afraid of asking your questions because yeah. if you aren't asking it, there's somebody that you know, wants yeah. to ask the same question. So it, helps everybody the number of people that we saw at the world show that are just getting started there should be lots oh, there's a lot yeah there should be lots of questions next week so we're excited all right we'll see you next week